Welcome to Act and Unwind, an ongoing conversation on a free and virtuous society. I'm your host, Eric Cohn. I want to thank you for listening and ask that if you're listening to us on our website, that you navigate right now to the show notes for this episode, where you will find a link to subscribe directly to Act and Unwind at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else where you listen to find podcasts. And if you like this program, please leave us a five-star review at Apple Podcasts so as to help more people find our show. Today, I'm joined by Dan Huger, Acton's librarian and a research associate, and we'll be discussing the uh, Bolsonaro election defeat in Brazil. But first, we're going to go to some place that I actually just was last week in San Francisco, California. San Francisco, California is headquarters of uh, one social media platform called Twitter, which if you have been hiding under a rock, you may be blissfully unaware of the fact that Elon Musk, the uh, founder of Tesla and SpaceX, is now also uh, the big man in charge, as he put it on his Twitter bio, Chief Twit at Twitter. Uh, The deal that Musk had formed, some people thinking originating with a joke or in jest to buy Twitter uh, was finally finalized after uh, much politicking and legal back and forth where it appeared that Musk was trying to get out of the deal uh, ends up going through and within the, uh, the first, well, first of all, in style really fitting for the platform that he just purchased. The first thing he did was tweet a video of himself arriving at Twitter's office with the text, let that sink in, while he carries a ceramic sink into the lobby of Twitter, which I think really is just the perfect encapsulation of this. Because what I'm having a hard time delineating is the extent to which Musk is serious about this. Like he actually wants to make the kinds of changes in line with the rhetoric that he has used that would, uh, in his opinion, make Twitter a better platform. Or if he really is just having fun and it's a troll. And I know it can be both, but trying to figure out where the line is and if it's majority troll or majority seriousness, I think that may change from moment to moment for him. But nonetheless, he does seem to be having a good time. He immediately dismissed uh, several top executives, including the CEO and the CFO. Uh, He's floated the idea of charging $20 a month to people who have the blue check marks behind their name for them to keep their verification. Dan, to what extent do you think Elon Musk is serious about his motivation for buying Twitter, taking it private, no longer a public company, to be able to make the kind of changes that he thinks are necessary to make it a true free speech platform? How much do you think he's motivated by that? And how much do you think he may be motivated by the entertainment value of all of this? I think about this the way that people buy sports cars. Are they serious about going fast? Yes. Like in a sense, they absolutely. They want to go fast. But it's also about sort of having the thing. And I think of this as, you know, If he were very much serious about the business proposition of Twitter, there wouldn't have been the back and forth in trying to get out of the deal. I think he probably has some ideas that may or may not improve the platform, but I don't think that he's fundamentally animated by a really concrete business plan that he thinks is a winner. I think that this started out as a troll, got a little out of hand, and at this point, he's trying to make the best of it while still enjoying it. You know, um, there's a lot of maintenance and upkeep with sports cars, even though they're very fun. Uh, you know, you've got to buy that premium fuel, and I think that's 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 what he's going to begin to find out is uh, that uh, while this is indeed fun and he's very much enjoying himself now uh, that in order to keep this 
um, as a viable platform or to indeed improve it, that's going to require uh, some serious work, um, you know. To get the most out of your sports car, you have to go to driving school. You have to get in track time. You have to. It's uh, I think I think best case scenario, this winds up a hobby that uh, he acquires some skill in and uh, delivers some value to all the Twitter users. Uh, uh, in the end, the worst case scenario is, you know, this becomes, you know, it sits in the garage all day and it's just there. Um, it slowly degrades, doesn't provide value for users and uh, that he moves on to uh, something else. And he's got a lot else going on to move on to. It is a expensive Midlife crisis purchase. If we're going to look at it that way, forty-four billion dollar acquisition. Uh, it remind me of the joke that I heard around the time that Jeff Bezos purchased Whole Foods, uh, and it, the joke was Jeff Bezos saying to his Amazon Alexa, "Alexa, buy something from Whole Foods," and the response from Alexa is, "Buying Whole Foods." Oops. <laughs> uh, I, I think the. Balance that you you struck there is probably correct. I, I don't think Elon Musk is really in any way indifferent to the kinds of things or not serious about the concerns that he has raised about uh, Twitter as a platform um, and whether or not the attempts for him to get out of the deal really were about trying to discover uh, you know more of the nature of the company, how bad the problem with bots actually is. It's just for me it it. Anybody who's stating with absolute certainty what uh, whether or not Musk was serious from the get go about this, I think is just is deluding themselves in some fashion. Um, like there's there's too much of both at play. Uh, but what what I really wonder is is he in a position? Is there anything that he can do from a corporate level that actually improves this as a platform? And I think. What you're seeing, I mean, one, we, we saw it from the beginning, the kind of elite panic that was going on over the idea that Elon Musk, who uh, I, I think – I can't remember if we talked about this before. I, I find the reaction to Elon Musk from fellow elites to be somewhat fascinating and particularly from a left elites. What – it kind of amazes me is that he's done something that a lot of them claim that they wanted done for a very long period of time, right? He has created a desirable electric vehicle, right? So we're not using fossil fuels in the same way that we are fueling up a car, not uh, take, putting the premium gas in, uh, in the sports car that you were just describing there. It is they're, – they're not cheap, uh, but the – they're approaching affordability in a way that other – electric or hybrid cars uh, initially weren't. But he's doing it with just such fun and zeal that and he's making it available beyond what it had previously been, where if you owned an electric car, it was essentially virtue signaling. It was being able to say, I've got the means and I care so much about the environment that I've made this purchase. And it, as it becomes more mainstream, it loses that value. It loses that sheen for people who would have an electric car. So because he has democratized it and because he is doing it with this kind of swashbuckling devil may care attitude about pretty much everything in his public life he is despised for it by that group of elites that wish him to act in a, in a more pious way and i think you see that as well in the reaction that he got the letter that twitter employees delivered to him that read you know very much i, I heard somebody say this it's 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 like a group of freshmen and sophomores at at kenyan college who are making demands of the uh, the dean and the president of the university and musk is in an interesting place because he is certainly not predisposed to care about those people's approval and you've uh, we'll include in the show notes well the piece is about um if he's not going to turn around and start firing people, there are a lot of people who are going to leave. He's going to have an opportunity. Again, I say him as if he's going to make all these direct hiring decisions. He will be in an opportunity to put trusted people in a place to staff up this company in a way that is more copacetic with his I think, generally First Amendment views on freedom of speech. 
Uh, I, I wrote a piece in the Detroit News a while back that we'll include in the show notes as well that I, I, I want to invoke here because I think it still maintains. The point in it still holds, which is I don't know if Elon Musk can actually improve this platform in part because the problem isn't as much Elon, you know, the who is who is owns Twitter or even who runs Twitter. The problem is us. The, the problem is the way that people who are on that platform act and interact and react to others, the quick mob mentality that it creates. And I don't know that there are tweaks that can be made to the algorithm and dials that can be turned and switches that can be flipped by Musk or any new executive brass or C-suite people or just general employees that is going to change that, even if it does become more freewheeling and less censorious, which certainly had grown to over time. I don't know that it changes the problems that originate from Twitter that I think exist by nature of the concept of the platform and our own human nature. And I think I think you're right when you point to there's a sort of inner elite conflict here. And one of the things that's very that's unique about Twitter is its users, not just its staff, skew more left wing on the hall, more college educated, more white, more all of those sort of, you know, uh, any sort of, if you were to do, you know, a demography of American progressives, Twitter, Twitter fits that more than any other sort of social media platform. So when you come antagonizing those folks and not only antagonizing of course famously the CEO the CEO the CFO those people can be fired and those people can be replaced can you replace a user base for a product and i think the answer is the the answer is yes but that's a much trickier proposition particularly when you know the folks whose lives are consumed by Twitter that I see are academics, politicians, news uh, journalists, people in the media of all kinds. Um, and that's part of the value proposition. Part of why Musk was concerned about Twitter as a public square is he saw it as having influence over society, particularly over the political world, particularly over the media landscape and in academia. And how you can – I don't know if you can reform those things. I don't know if the problem with those things is the way people message each other over social media. Like I think all of those, all of those institutions have problems – uh, I think many of those problems are exacerbated by social media, but I don't think they're fundamentally rooted there. And, you know, if there's a critical mass of these people that derive their value from this, leave, I don't see any obvious replacement for them in terms of, 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 of maintaining – uh, Twitter's sort of influence and and high leverage as as a sort of social media social media space. This is similar to the argument that I made for most of the years that Donald Trump was president. To make a brief political point here, which is the uh, set aside your feelings about that whole experience for a moment and just say that like I think it was it helped a lot of people realize there were some problems with this country and I don't think Donald Trump caused any of those problems. I think he's a symptom of those problems. I think what you described is is correct that uh, there are problems in the political landscape in our political institutions in media institutions in academia in those institutions uh, that Twitter makes worse social media in general makes worse but it didn't create those problems it probably is 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 making it worse but it didn't create them they originate someplace else uh, and I again I don't know how much musk can actually influence the 
uh, kind of status seeking part of all of this. I, I, I do think, in a way, the requirement to subscribe to to Twitter Blue, which is the subscription service, it's basically there. Twitter's attempt to compete with something like Substack, that's doing these paid newsletters for people who are, in most cases, journalists who've left larger publications and are going out on their own. Uh, that you need to subscribe to that in order to keep your blue check mark. I, I, one of the things I just think is going to be fascinating is. You know, how initially you, I remember we could go back to uh, when Trump was banned from Twitter and you had all of these activists on the right, journalists on the right, journalist activists on the right, saying that they were going to leave Twitter for Gab or Truth Social or something else. And for the most part, nobody did. This is like the people who always caterwaul about elections and say that if so-and-so wins, I'm moving to Canada. And pretty much nobody ever does it. I think it's going to be interesting to see now the same people who freaked out about Elon Musk buying it if any of them are going to, one, depart the platform at all, or B, if this uh, – well, one, I did one and B. Uh, two – if this plan to require them to purchase a subscription service to maintain their precious blue check mark is actually going to motivate them to, to do that, which ties into one of the things that Musk actually does have to try to do now that he has purchased this. If he doesn't want this to just become like the sports car that you described and kind of a, uh, a you know, a sunken cost problem, one that continually cost him a lot of money to maintain. You know, like, is he going to think about this? Kind of like a sports franchise where if you're like Steve Cohen buying the New York Mets, of course you want the Mets to be profitable, but you're worth however many billions of dollars and it's a play toy for you. Um, I, I'm interested to see if Musk can make and really could solve the biggest problem that Twitter always had. Like people misidentify the biggest problem that as a company Twitter had. I don't think it was ever the kind of – uh, user base issues that we were talking about here and the way people interact with each other, nor do I think it was the um, censorious regime that existed there that I think we probably all agree. Uh, well, some content moderation is, is necessary. Twitter certainly had problems in the way that it approached all of that. The question is, can it be a profitable company? And I don't know what the answer to that question is. And one of the challenges Musk is going to have is to figure out a way to make a company that, to my understanding, and anybody's welcome to correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong about this, I don't think it's ever made money. Um, it is largely – the value, stock valuation, same way that you know, we see this in a lot of tech companies that their valuation far outstrips the actual revenue and profit that they bring in. That's the biggest thing Musk has to solve for. And I just don't know if he has a plan there or if there is a plan that actually makes Twitter profitable. I think that's true. And I think the analogy to sports teams is instructive because sports in the United States are mostly run by cartels. We call them leagues. You know, we have the National Hockey League. We have the National Basketball Association. We have the National Football League. You can run a sports team into the ground. Randy Smith did it in Detroit <laughs> uh, for the Tigers. There are many, many f examples throughout all of sports. But there's only so many teams. And there is scarce – real estate there. So if, you know, you can have an absolutely terrible basketball team sell for more money than any basketball team has ever sold to because there are people that are anxious to own a basketball team. And one of the reasons they're anxious to own it is it doesn't really matter how they run it. As long as the sport in general is successful, that team will always have value. This is not true of social media. I mean, we, people talk about big tech and they talk about these companies, but MySpace was a big player in early social media. And now- I'm old enough to remember Friendster. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's no reason why Twitter has to be one of the big three or four social media platforms five years from now in a way that the Sacramento Kings will be a basketball team five years from now, no matter how bad they are. Um, and so I think there's a real 
there's a real imperative if you even just want to recoup your original purchase price. Like you have to generate value there in some way that, you know, the Twitter name and, and Twitter's place in public life is not guaranteed. And there were a lot of people, including Elon Musk, who were very frustrated with the way that Twitter was run. Uh, there are a great deal of people, you know, this morning <laughs> that are very frustrated with changes. They, this this charging for the blue check. I have seen uh, blue checks very, very angry about this. And this is, you know, he's talking to $20. It's a very nominal yeah. fee. And I'm not sure in addition to the check, maybe there's some additional functionality that comes with that. Um, but these the prospect of $20 a month for journalists who make their living writing stories, sharing their stories, promoting their stories, the visceral reaction to this makes me think that Twitter's not in a secure place and that maybe, you know, you don't need everyone to do – to leave for Canada. If you get enough people – because all of these, all of these, the value is in the network. And if you get a critical mass of people to leave because they're frustrated with the direction of the platform, because they think, you know, fees are onerous, like there are rivals out there. This is not the only game in town. And there is a, now a whole new set of incentives. We talked about some of these alternative platforms to Twitter that many people on the right, you know, none of those really panned out. That doesn't mean that it's left-wing equivalent won't. Uh, you know, right-wing talk radio took this nation by storm. You know, Air America did not um, because there were unique things. And I think if you look at left-wing elites in this country, they are very much more online. They are more invested in Twitter in particular. And this might just be, you know, uh, a space in at least American culture where um, you might not be able to run a successful network of this kind and shift its orientation or its demographics too much to the center because so much of the activity and so much of the value is generated by people on the quote unquote left. So let's close this out with a question that I will ask you and I will also answer myself as a two part question. Uh, with you know, apologies to Rich Lowry and the editor's podcast at National Review who does these exit questions. I'm going to steal from him just for this one time. First part of the question. In one year, will Twitter be discernibly better? And part two, in seven years, will Twitter exist? I think Twitter will be exactly the same as it is. It might have a different set of problems – um, whether it exists in seven years, I think this is a space that's rife for disruption. And I don't think this has to do with Musk buying it. I think the question, does Twitter exist in at least the recognizable form, you know, will there be an app that some people use? Yes. Uh, whether it is what it is today, seven years from now, I think is a, is a totally open question. You look at the place, you know, where was Twitter seven years ago in – what is this now? 2015? Uh, you know, Twitter's what, 10 years old? 11 years old as a product. And we, te we tend to forget this. So seven years is a – very long time, especially for what is it, the third, fourth most popular social media app here? I mean, this is not the most used platform, although it certainly is among certain sets of people, think tankers among them. Uh, I think I think it's a very open question as to whether it'll be around uh, seven years from now. And that could have very little to do with Elon Musk. 
Uh, for the record, Twitter was founded March 21st, 2006, so 16 years old. Of course, it takes some time for it to come into its own and really <clears throat> become what it what it is right now. Uh, the answer to question number one is uh, Dan got it exactly right. I think it will be pretty much the same. And in seven years, uh, I'm going to go with no. I don't think Twitter exists in seven years. It has been replaced by something else. But that that's the key point, is not that the conversation, not what Twitter represents is going away, but what these individual companies, I think, are uh, much less secure than the desire for what they serve is. And it will take some kind of a different form. The Sacramento Kings will be here in seven years. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's move on to our second topic, which is the presidential election in Brazil. So there's a runoff uh, election, which we got results for over the weekend. Uh, The current president, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, uh, comes in with about 49 percent of the vote, about 58 million votes. And um, his opponent, uh, Lula, uh, almost 51 percent of the vote, uh, about two million, a little more than two million more votes than Bolsonaro got. So uh, Bolsonaro... It's tied into these conversations that we've been having about the rise of populism around the world, not just here in the United States. You had a lot of leaders around the same time that Donald Trump becomes president, that uh, once people established uh, really something for them to – themselves to fixate on in in Trump and start seeing patterns emerge around the rest of the world, or at least that was the perception. People like Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, you've got comparisons of Boris Johnson in the United Kingdom, um, uh, Duterte in the Philippines. Uh, The question that is really preoccupying people right now about this Brazil election is whether or not Bolsonaro himself is going to accept the outcome of this election. Uh, so I, I, what I first start wondering then is, look, there's a lot to the narrative about uh, the threats to democracy. We have a p- election coming up in uh, this country in just a little over a week, and there are some people who very much would like the election to be a debate about threats to democracy. Uh, which I, I don't think is an irrelevant issue, but it is certainly not what is foremost on voters' minds. Um, do you see wh- – where do you see now that uh, like Bolsonaro looks to have lost this election, this global wave of populism? What do you think if there's anything we should take away from Bolsonaro losing to Lula and if that means anything for what we've been told is this rising tide of uh, right-wing populism, often illiberal populism, uh, not just in the United States, but in places like Brazil and around the world. So in Latin America, you often have poor choices. Um, this reminds me a lot of there was an election in Peru, the last election cycle in Peru, where you have, you know, you have – you know, uh, Lula, who was convicted on corruption charges, spent some time in prison, was later – that was later overturned, but an undoubtedly corrupt administration uh, under uh, under Brazil. Um, you have had an extremely dysfunctional uh, state under, under President Bolsonaro. Um, I think whether or not – Bolsonaro arose, when Bolsonaro was first elected, it was part of an extremely eclectic coalition. Um, and he became the leader of that through some sort of political maneuvering and through also sort of sort of by default. So I will be interested in the coming weeks to see what the parties, the sort of various center to right parties that have been involved in various capacities in the Bolsonaro regime, how they react to this election. Um, Because Bolsonaro does not lead a long established dominant party. He leads a very fractious coalition um, that came to power um, only very recently. Um, this is, uh, 2018. So I think, I think a lot of, a lot of, you know, Brazil's 
democracy is younger than ours, um, you know, uh, since uh, 1980 was uh, his latest sort of instantiation, um, although it has a, a history that goes back further than that. Um, so you have a lot of this depends on a, on the, on the political coalition, I think. Um, you also have, I think, to tie this back in to our last conversation. I remember when President Bolsonaro was elected, I had a Brazilian friend who in the uh, months and weeks leading up to the election would share with me all of these WhatsApp messages he would get as part of these sort of pro-Bolsonaro groups. And a lot of them are, you know, memes, funny things. Some of them are stories. Some are, are true stories about corruption. Some of, of, the, of the opposition, some of these are, are sort of fantastical, obviously made up things. And you have this phenomenon when we talk about the sort of dysfunction that Twitter puts into a political landscape like the United States, I think what I see on WhatsApp is a whole nother level beyond this. And there's a way in which it could be worse. There was a, a, a gentleman, uh, a young political activist in India, uh, Shivram uh, Singh, who wrote a book called How to Win an Indian Election, about his involvement in the 2014 campaign for the BJP and, and now Prime Minister Modi, and how these sort of WhatsApp groups are likewise used in India by right-wing populists as a way to sort of get messages out. Um, these are much less, these are much more opaque. These aren't, you know, if you, you know, the Republican National Committee has a Twitter and can put out, uh, you know, tweets. You have, you know, you know, the, uh, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, can put out tweets. Um, we know where those come from. Um, they're attributable to the source. Sometimes they are more truthful, sometimes they're less truthful, but everyone sees them and we can all debate them. And it's different from these sort of isolated WhatsApp groups. And I think you've got a real, uh, a real question of how much of this sort of populism is a product of new ways of organizing. President Trump is famously a master of the form of Twitter. He absolutely tweeted himself to office. Anytime he wanted to be at the head of the news cycle, he knew he could pick up his phone and he could do it. And I think these dynamics, I mean, populism is very, very old phenomena. I think what we are seeing now across uh, the left and the right internationally is new ways that that emerges and new ways that that's sustained in an information age. And I think that is the story that will remain with us um, through these election cycles is the way that these things sort of transform our politics uh, for good and for and for ill. The point that you made about Bolsonaro leading a relatively new coalition uh, it reminds me of uh, the point I can't remember who it was who said it made about um, American third parties in the American political setting that they're like bees. They have their effect by stinging once and then they die. I think that's certainly true in the American political setting where we have distilled into this you know, duopoly of two political parties that largely represent uh, the two sides of an argument in the American political system. There are third parties that exist, but they don't really matter all of that much. I think it is interesting that you see, you can point to Brazil, you can point to France, you can point to Israel, where you're seeing these very tenuous coalitions often held uh, in, in at least the cases of Brazil and in France led by newly formed political parties wrapped up primarily in the charisma of a single individual that establishes this leadership and this role in this government for a period of time. But it doesn't really last. I think even in places where the party structure and the political structure are far more instantiated, uh, 
places like the United Kingdom. I mean, we certainly see the craziness that is going on in government in the United Kingdom that I know you all talked about last week when I was out. And I just want to, as a quick sidebar, uh, just make this note because I find it amusing. Um, taking our film, The Hong Konger, uh, around the country and also overseas to do screenings, I was in London recently for a screening of the film. I was there for three days. That was 7% of Liz Truss's term as prime minister was the three days that I was in, in London. I can't wait to someday tell, tell my grandchildren about uh, the Liz Truss era and how I visited during it. But you certainly see the, the, the tumult that has been created around this. And I, I think that you can adapt – you can figure out a way to reshape the British one to kind of understand it, the stinging once and then die point. Uh, Boris Johnson, why does Boris Johnson become prime minister? Primarily to get Brexit done because that was that's the stinging once that really reshaped the what was in the water of the the body politic at the time to terribly mix a metaphor there. Um, so I, I think it is interesting that you see – these kind of fleeting coalitions and these single charismatic individuals. And in a way, right, the rest of the world, especially South America, far more used to this kind of thing than I think the United States was. I think that honestly was a reason for a lot of the panic that went on from a lot of people about Donald Trump. Um, and often there was merit to being somewhat panicked by the things that were going on. But if you look at the history of, say, Italian politics, you can find plenty of people to compare Donald Trump to in the way that he acted and behaved and the, the kind of populism that he represented. You can find that more readily in different places around the world. We just seem to be so much less familiar with it, in part because we don't really know our own history well, I think. Yeah, in 19th century America, you yeah. see this. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the, I've stolen this from Jonah Goldberg, but the great line that defines populism to me is from William Jennings Bryan, who says, uh, the people of Nebraska are for free silver, therefore I am for free silver. I will look up the arguments later. Uh, and you you see this kind of thing throughout American history. I think we just have some blind spots for the places that it actually popped up and some lack of willingness to be honest about some of the political periods of our past that we don't like uh, relitigating some of that political history. But I just – I do find it interesting that you have these – very new coalitions that are representing a lot of this populist uprising, again, influenced by social media. And I still think on the relatively long tail of the financial crisis from 2008, I really think that that was a uh, a moment in time that set in motion a lot of the things that we are still dealing with now in the year 2022. So I, th I think I think this is absolutely right. I think if you go back to the 19th century, is part part of the question is we as 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 a world, um, let alone we in particular, you know, what, what we talk about is the West have had mass democracy for a very, very short time. And one of the things that, you know, we all value democratic norms, traditions, these sorts of things. But one of the things that always comes along with it are these sorts of mass populist movements. Um, these things sort of go hand in hand. What we had from, you know, the 1920s, 1930s until, you know, living memory were a set of institutions that were crafted to sort of deal with that. And we talk about, you know, modern journalistic standards, modern mass media, modern party systems, all of those institutions have failed in very important ways and many people distrust them for many legitimate reasons um and now you have uh, the sort of new technological tools where that distrust can be exploited and weaponized and is so now i think you need to think through okay what is what is the new institutional response um, there are folks, you know, on the left who want to veer in a censorious direction of this is the way if, 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 if the sort of the media can't 
police itself, if social media increasingly displaces the regular, uh, the traditional media, um, then there needs to be some sort of, you know, way to address what they call misinformation and disinformation um, from the state actively doing that rather than professional media standards sort of policing those. And it's very clear that no one has an appetite for that. Um, even even many folks on the left are, I think, deeply unsettled and rightly so with that sort of approach. But I think there is still, you know, there is there is an opportunity for bridging those divides, reducing polarization, uh, increasing the reliability and usefulness of information. But that's going to take a new set of institutions that are really dedicated to these things and that are nonpartisan, that are not ideologically driven. And, you know, if in the next seven years, institutions like that arise, I think that is the most likely replacement for social media as it is today. Let's call it a wrap there. Thank you for listening to Act and Unwind. If you're listening to this podcast on our website, please look in the show notes for a link where you can subscribe directly to Act and Unwind or just search Act and Unwind on your favorite podcast app. Also, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, five-star reviews only, so that more people can find this show. Thanks to Dan. For the Acton Institute, I'm Eric Cohn. We'll see you next week.